would seem redundant to introduce myself again, so I'm just going to let you know about a couple things about myself and make a little confession. Um, I love to talk, and any of you who know me pretty much know this. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Myers-Briggs personality type assessment? Right? Some, many of you probably took it in college. Uh, many of you may have taken it as a part of your, um, your job with your career path. Well, I recently took the assessment again. I did take it in college, but I recently took it again to see if I had changed, and I hadn't. Um, it confirmed for me that I am, in fact, an extrovert. How many of you are shocked by this? Um, I am an ESFP, so I am an extrovert, and I really love to just converse with people. It's one of my favorite pastimes. It's, it's one of the things that I just I simply love to fill my time with. I love to just sit and talk with people, people, that, uh, people here at church, people at work, friends, family, it doesn't matter. Uh, I stopped by uh, the Smith's house the other night, Margaret and, and Ralph, just to drop off keys that Noel had left here at the building. And I think we stood outside uh, Margaret's uh, front door talking for probably half an hour. You know, so I really love, just, I really love to just talk to people, right? Um, my wife will probably tell you that I waste a lot of time talking. Usually because I'll text her and say, yeah, I'm on my way home, or yeah, I'm leaving work. And then I'll come home like, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour later, and she's like, well, what happened to you're on your way? I was like, oh, well, you know, I, I bumped into this person, I talked to this person, and it was just, you know, it was crazy, whatever. Uh, she just rolls her eyes and, you know, wishes she didn't marry such an extrovert, but it's okay. There is nothing I love to do more than to just sit and talk with people that I care about and people that I have relationship with. When I go to Delaware for a meeting on a Sunday afternoon or something, I'll stop into my parents' house because they live not too far from where I have to go. And I'll stop in just to say hi or to pick something up. And I'm probably there for an hour or two, just catching up with my parents, whatever. Um, and then, you know, when I, I'm here at the office getting work done, um, I can't tell you how much time I end up spending either in uh, Mark's office or Kyle's office just catching up on things because we don't see each other super often, but you know, we're just catching up on life or whatever, and uh, a quick question turns into a long discussion. And so it usually is just this, I have no problem talking with people, right? My mom and my, my grandmother uh, probably uh, passed this on to me, probably easiest, uh, my mom and my grandmother have uh, the spiritual gift of gab. Um, they have no problem holding a conversation with an absolute stranger. And much to my, uh, my wife's chagrin, I have no problem talking to people at the Walmart checkout aisle. Um, so I just don't have a problem talking, right? One time in college, for about three months, I was doing an internship with Wyndham Resorts in their IT department. Now, I don't know much about, you know, actual networking or anything like that. All I was doing was, you know, just different things on the computer, trying to help people get access to their stuff, whatever. That's not important. But I had a cubicle, this little, you know, typical cubicle. I had a desk, and I had a, a computer with, you know, two monitors, whatever. And I worked on a team of about eight people who I never saw. And most of my communication was either over the phone, which was rare, or through an email. So... My entire summer was just was really miserable. I hated being in this cubicle. I, I don't understand how those of you who work in an office or in a cubicle do it. Um, I just, I couldn't do it. I was so happy the day that I was able to go to my supervisor at that job and say, okay, well, I'm going back to school, so, you know, this is, I think, where we're, we're ending the internship, right? And he goes, yeah, that's fine, whatever. And then, like, a couple days later, I ended up getting a job at Chick-fil-A, and it has completely changed my entire life with my job because now I have a job where I'm able to interact with people constantly, just, you know, talking one-on-one. -on -one. See, many of you, I think, are probably in the same boat. You're nodding and you're, you're, you, you can relate to the idea of just loving to talk to people. And I see it every week when we turn off the lights in here after service, and many of you are still, you know, in the, the rows here talking, catching up with those who you love here at church. But as much as I love to talk, and I'm sure many of you may feel the same, there's one thing I probably don't do enough. Let's pray. I probably don't talk to God as much as I should, or as much as I even want to. Sometimes I feel like I go, you know, days to weeks without really spending good quality time in prayer. 
And I often find myself only praying when it suits my needs or some situation that I'm in. And see, I'm probably most dedicated to prayer when my life is in some sort of upheaval or I'm facing some sort of crisis. Doesn't that seem pretty typical? We tend to think of prayer like a genie in a bottle commodity. We need, when we need something to happen or we want something for ourselves or, or something's got to change, we exhaust all ideas that we can come up with until we finally say, well, I guess all I can do now is pray. We consider God last when he should be the first place we turn. Today we're going to talk about prayer, obviously. But the ideas that I want to focus on today will hopefully help us build and become built strong in our spiritual lives. I want to look at five major considerations for prayer. First, we will look at why we need to pray. We'll look at when we should pray. We'll look at how we should pray, where we should pray, and who are we praying to. But before we get to all that, I want to establish some key details about prayer as a discipline. Prayer takes time. It's not something that is simply lip service. It can't be rushed through. Therefore, it really shouldn't be the same type of prayer that we do at mealtime where it's just a quick blessing, not an express blessed situation. It takes time to pay respect, honor, and praise to the Father when you come into his presence. You should address the Father in reference to his reverence. Jesus showed us how to do this. He said, Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. May your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. When you don't take the time to address the Father's reverence, you diminish the wonderful privilege that we have to go to the Lord without a priestly intercessory. Take time with your prayers and make sure that you don't disregard the awesome nature of prayer, of coming directly to the Father. See, there was a time about 2017 plus years ago where not everyone could simply go and have communion with the Father. In the Old Testament, we see that only the priesthood could serve in the temple. And then only the high priest could go to the Father in the Holy of Holies. In the temple, there were several courts and divisions in, in the temple architecture. And as you progress through the temple, those divisions became more and more segregated. Each division filtered down to the high priest, who was allowed to go into the innermost place, the Holy of Holies, which was divided from the rest by what was called the veil. This veil was a thick curtain of cloth, but it might as well have been a wall built of brick and mortar. See, this was a figurative but literal divider between man and God. Only one man in the nation, the, whole, the high priest, and only on one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, could he enter the Holy of Holies, which was where the Ark of the Covenant was located. And the Ark served as a physical representation of God's presence. It's hard for us to understand this, this division, this separation, because of our new covenant perspective, being able to go directly to the Father. It's one of the appealing things about being a Christian. But let me paint this a different way. Imagine the person that you love most in this life. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe a child, or maybe it's your parent. Imagine being separated from that individual and unable to talk to them or be with them for the rest of your life. It sounds pretty painful. See, I can't imagine being away from my wife for more than several days. And I definitely can't imagine being uh, unable to communicate with her for a long period of time. My heart breaks for military families in our country who are separated by long deployments. But this idea is only a small reflection of how the veil separated us from God. Let's look at this in Matthew 27, verse 45. We're going to look at the crucifixion account real fast here, or a piece of it. In Matthew 27, verse 45, it says, At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. 
At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? In verse 50, he sa- it says, then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The veil was torn. That divider was torn. The separation between us and God was torn in two so that it could no longer separate us. This is the good news of Christ. The good news is really simple. Because of Christ, we can have fellowship and communion with God. This also means that we no longer need the temple priesthood to act as an intercessory between us and God. We no longer need a priest to go to God for us. Jesus is our intercessory, and he makes the way for us to talk to and go to and have communion with the Father. What's your point, Chris? It's no small thing, and it it didn't come without great cost, that we have the ability to go to the Father in prayer and in his presence. It is a big deal that we have this privilege and the the ability as children of God to go to our Father and bring praise and petition. So let's not take prayer for granted. We tend to forget how amazing it is because it's it's there. It's, it's, It's always something we can tap into. But I think the other reason we take it for granted is because we don't make it a discipline in our lives. Prayer is a discipline, and it doesn't come naturally to us. We are typically a out-of-sight, out-of-mind type of people. We get so busy in our day that we forget that we need to reach out to God. We forget that he's there waiting to talk to us. There isn't an easy way to make your prayer life a discipline. It isn't, there isn't an app that can instantly improve your prayer life. It takes work, it takes discipline, it takes time, and it takes dedication. But I believe that prayer as a spiritual discipline is one of the best ways for us to draw close and to be built strong. It is one of the best ways to to get close to God and to deepen your faith. Prayer forces us to communicate to the Father and to open up our hearts to Him. Prayer helps us nurture this deep relationship we have with God. Let's go back to our five points. Why, when, how, where, and who. In order to give any significant consideration to making prayer a discipline, we have to understand why we're doing it. Our first why for prayer is that prayer is an expectation. In the book of Matthew, Jesus instructs us on how we're to pray. And in this account of Jesus' teaching on prayer and fasting, he, is, he begins three different instructions the same way. He says in Matthew 6, 5 through 7, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is the, all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray... Go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. When you pray, when you pray, when you pray. Jesus expected it of us. It wasn't just... It wasn't something that he said, if you're inclined to pray, if you ever want to, feel like dropping me a line. This was an expectation. When prayer is, is a discipline, we, we know that it's, it's something that's a part of us, and it's expected of us. Jesus wants this for us. The Israelites used to pray at least twice a day. They would pray the Shema, which is found in Deuteronomy 6. And we see priests and kings and even servants of God crying out all through the Old Testament. Prayer is expected of us as children of God. I believe that it is expected because God knows that it will strengthen our relationship with him. 
He knows that it allows us to connect with his spirit. And he knows that we need our Father. Furthermore, God desires to talk to us, and he desires for us to talk to him. Our second why for prayer is that we get to talk to God. It's that simple. You get to talk to the creator of the world. How many other religions really let you freely converse with a deity in their, in their structure? Most other religions teach that their deity is an angry God that must be appeased before pleas or petitions can be made. But we have the ability to go to God with what's on our mind, and he actually cares about it because he cares about us. You have the opportunity to talk with the being who put life inside you. Imagine, if you will, for just a moment, that you're playing golf with the President of the United States. And he offered you the opportunity to express your opinion or to make some request. Would you squander that opportunity? Would you squander that chance? I think if I had the chance to to play golf or to talk with... Uh, the most powerful man in the free world, I'd probably have some pretty outrageous requests, right? I mean, maybe just money, or I don't know, but different types of blessings. We have that ability in kind. We have someone powerful in our corner. We have a father ready to lavish us with blessings and to help us when we need him. We have the connection and ability to talk to God anytime we want. So often we do nothing with that. We need to pray because it forces us to rely on God. When we take our problems and our petitions to God, it forces us to to let go of our worries and our concerns and to allow him to take them from us. The psalmist tells us in Psalms 55, 22, Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. So we need to pray because it is expected of us as children of God. We also need to pray because it strengthens and deepens our relationship with the Father. Relationship requires communication. He has spoken to us through his word. Now we need to speak to him through prayer. We need to pray because it teaches us to trust God with our problems. Well, okay, we've established the need for prayer, but when do we need to pray and how often? Should I pray at mealtimes or just in the morning and in the evening? Should I pray when something good or bad happens? Should I pray when the prayer list comes out on Wednesday or only when someone asks me to on Facebook? Paul tells us that we are to pray without ceasing. In, In the Thessalonians passage, it literally says, never stop praying. We need to constantly be in prayer. Does that mean that we need to go high on a mountaintop, away from people and technology for the rest of our lives, and and only pray every moment of every day? Does that mean that we walk around all the time throughout our day, praying out loud, looking like we're boasting, or looking like we've lost our marbles? Of course not. But it does mean that prayer needs to be a constant in our life. We need to have our hearts and our minds in a connected mindset at all times. See, as much as you talk to maybe your best friend or your spouse, your parents or your children, you should be praying that amount of time and more. It doesn't mean that you have to stop and have an hour-long prayer time every time you have a worry or something happens or you hear of some tragedy going on in our world. You should pray often and pray regularly. You may say, but Chris, sometimes I feel bad and I don't, I don't feel like praying. Well, the best thing to do when you're down and you don't feel like talking to God is to do just that. Go talk to God. We need to rely on God in all situations, good and bad. Think about King David. Let's talk about somebody who had some ups and downs in his life. He is credited with being a man after God's own heart. And when we say that, we think, well, then he shouldn't have any any problems at all in his life. He should be fine. He probably had it pretty good. He was a king. Well, he, like the rest of us, was human. We have consequences for our choices, and David understood that. 
He writes in Psalm 71, verses 1 through 4, O Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me and rescue me, for you do what is right. Turn your ear to listen to me and set me free. Be my rock of safety where I can always hide. Give the order to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. My God, rescue me from the power of the wicked, from the clutches of cruel oppressors. David was a man after God's own heart, but we see that he faced numerous crises and bad situations in his life. He was attacked and hated by his king. He was chased out of his homeland. He was hunted by the army that he once led. He committed adultery and murder and lost the child conceived in that adultery. He lost his son Amnon because he, Amnon, raped his sister and was later killed by his brother Absalom. Absalom would later lead a rebellion and try to usurp David's throne. So many things went wrong in David's life. And many of these crises were the result of sin, either David's or someone else's. But regardless of the crises he was facing, David was in prayer. He went to God when he was being hunted. He went to God in prayer when he was in mourning for the loss of his son. He went to God when he was convicted of his sins. The Psalms are 150 prayers of David, both praising God and crying out to him for help. We don't always like the idea of going to the Father. Maybe because we aren't always in the mood to enter the throne room and talk to the Father and be vulnerable. Sin separates us. When sin, in our, when sin is in our lives, we are less likely to want to be near to God. Pain also separates us. When we are in pain and we don't have a consistent prayer life, we recluse, we draw away from God. We hide and we run, telling ourselves that God only wants us when we're joyful. And See, that is a lie from Satan. God wants to be your refuge in the storms of your life. He wants to be the rock that you go to when everything seems wrong. He wants you to come to him so he can hold you in his arms and comfort you and protect you like a father to his child. He wants to work good in your life even when all around you seems like a mess. We have to discipline ourselves to go to God first. Even though we don't desire it in the, in the moment, we need to push ourselves to do that. Go to God. I have little desire to go to the gym. Okay, this is, a self, this is another confession. I, this is not a runner's body. I don't like to go lift weights. It's not something I like to do. I hate cardio, okay? Cardio to me means out of breath. I have no desire to go to the gym, which is why I usually don't. I, I would rather just pay LA Fitness $50 a month and say, we're good. You, you leave me alone, we're, we're happy. But going to the gym and exercising and working out and going for a run, exerting energy, it's not something we enjoy when we're just starting out, when we're just beginning that discipline. It's not until it becomes habit, until it becomes regular, be, until it becomes a constant, that it becomes bearable and enjoyable. In terms of the gym thing, I'm going to have to rely on the testimony of people like Colin and others who really love working out to, to vouch for that it's enjoyable, but they say it is, so we're going to go with it. I don't go often enough to really know, so... Going to God first may not be what we want to do. It may not seem natural or comfortable in the moment. It takes time to make it a regular habit or a practice for us to say, man, everything's falling apart around me. What in the world am I going to do? And for that instant thought to be, I need to pray. It takes consistency and dedication. I believe that the more often you pray over a period of time, the more you will feel comfortable praying and even desire to talk to God more. Maybe you need to set a goal with your prayer life in order to get yourself started. Maybe by dedicating a time of your day. Maybe in the morning while you're getting ready. There's probably 15 minutes of uninterrupted time between your shower and getting dressed that you could. Maybe not, moms, I don't know. If you have small children, I don't know. Maybe there's time on your drive to work. Maybe there's some time on your lunch break. 
Maybe there's some time during your drive home. Maybe while you're cooking dinner or cleaning up the house. Maybe there's some time right after the kids go to bed, right before you crash yourself. Again, prayer doesn't have to be up on the mountain. I just listed six possible times in your regular workday that you might be able to find some time to set aside to pray. We're going to talk about the places, the where we can pray in just a minute. But there are always pockets of time. We don't take advantage of the unused time in our day. And then how I pray is also another big concern or issue that we deal with. A big question for unpracticed prayers is, how do I pray effectively or correctly? How do I do it right? Let me start by saying I don't think that there's one correct method to prayer. We see multiple styles of prayer all throughout the Bible. Most of us are used to rote prayers like God is great, God is good, now we thank him for our food. Or now I lay me down to sleep. I'll be honest, I didn't much like these when I reached my adolescence. And, and rightly so, I, I had outgrown them for my prayer life. They had served the purpose in teaching me for a while. But we see rote prayers in the Old Testament. I want, mentioned one earlier, the Shema. It's one that was prayed twice a day by all Israelites. And it focused the Israelites onto a central purpose, that God was their one true heart fo- focus. Some people think that a deep prayer life sounds like King James Bible passages. But prayer often gets overly complicated by church stereotyping and highfalutin speeching. See, prayer is simple. It's not complicated. It isn't showy or pretentious. In fact, Jesus warns us against this type of praying. Look back to Matthew 6, 5. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. Don't be about the show of prayer. Be about the practice of it. Like I said a minute ago, prayer is simple. Look at the prayer of the tax collector and the the Pharisee in Luke 18, 10 through 13. Two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other one was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven when he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. The Pharisee was being showy and self-righteous, boasting about how good he was or how he thought God thought he was. The tax collector was humble and simple in his prayer. He was simply asking God for mercy. Maybe you're new to the idea of prayer, so I suggest that you start with what Richard Foster The writer of the book, Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home, describes in his first chapter. Simple prayer, he says, we bring ourselves before God just as we are. Like children before a loving father, we open our hearts and make our requests. We do not try to sort things out, the good from the bad. We simply and unpretentiously share our concerns and make our petitions. We tell God, for example, how frustrated we are with the coworker at the office or the neighbor down the street. We ask for food, favorable, favorable weather, and good health. Simple prayer focuses on us. We are the main subject of simple prayer. Not in all senses, but it focuses on what we desire, even if the desire is for another's benefit. Simple prayer is easy, because like the name indicates, it's simple. It's conversational. It's like talking to a friend or to a father. It doesn't require knowledge of Scripture or discernment of God's will. It is a great foundation to start from because it allows the prayer to learn to express themselves to God and to rely on God. But what, if I, what if I prefer more structure when I pray? Jesus gives us a good framework for this. 
And he, we can see that in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Now, this is called the model prayer, but I don't want you to fall into the easy trap of making this the only model by which you pray. But the structure here helps us understand how Jesus desires for us to give honor to God and how we should rely on God in our life and in our prayers. The prayer structure is broken up into honor, petition, sanctification, and deliverance. As we talked earlier, we need to take time in our prayers because we are entering the throne room of God and coming to the feet of the Father. We should feel comfortable asking God to provide for our needs because he loves us and Jesus also tells us that God will provide for us. Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds. Don't, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? We should also request and rely on the help of the Father for forgiveness and deliverance from our sin. Even Jesus prays for our deliverance and our safety from Satan. John 17, verse 15. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Structure is important to teaching us how to pray and gives us reminders in our prayers to deepen our talk with God. The best way to get better at the how is to simply pray. Making it something you do, practicing it, going deeper with it, becoming more vulnerable, that's how prayer gets better in your life. Where we pray is also important to being a quality prayer life. It isn't that we need to be in the church building or find a holy place in order to pray. It's not about a location, but rather a separation. We see examples and instruction that we should pray privately. Daniel prayed alone in his room with the window open toward Jerusalem. Matthew says to go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And Jesus, we see, prayed in secluded areas, alone with no one else around. Let's take our cue from them and pray to God on a vulnerable personal level in seclusion, alone where we can do so without being inhibited by others and distractions. Another facet to this is that we have to remove all of those little things in our life that take our attention away from God. See, we're constantly surrounded by other people, right? Either in your family or at work, um, maybe here at church even. We're constantly surrounded by people, technology, and noise. And it is difficult for us to focus on our talk with God. We have to separate ourselves from the noise and allow our time with the Father to be uninhibited. But this isn't going to happen in every moment of your prayer life. But it should be an effort taken by the prayer to make God the focal point of the prayer time. Give him your full attention. I had to learn this lesson pretty hard recently. My wife's love language is quality time, right? And, and we like to spend time talking and catching up about our day or whatever. But I, have really, I, have, I don't have ADHD and I don't have trouble necessarily focusing on things. But you'd think so by the way that I spend time with Tabby um, because I don't focus well um, unless uh, I literally put the phone away and I literally am just focused on her. So she's actually had to teach me this recently that we need to separate ourselves from all these distractions and dedicate our, our focus to God. The final thing I want to talk about is who we're praying to. In case we forget exactly who it is we're talking to when we're praying, let me remind you of some of his names and titles. He is the Abba, the Father of all and everyone. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the Eternal who is 
always been and who will always be. He is the Ancient of Days who was there in the beginning, the Creator who spoke this world into existence. He is the all-knowing, all-powerful God Most High who sees all, is in all, and who is in control of all. He is the King of the universe, the ruler of all creation, the sovereign Lord of all things, living and not. He is the Good Shepherd who loves and protects. He is the Great Physician who heals and redeems. He is the Lord of peace and righteousness. He is the Lord of hosts. He is Yahweh, the Great I Am. He is more than we can ever imagine. So when we come into his presence, when we come to God in prayer, we should be humbled and little because we are. We should not rush God off the phone like a pesky relative. We should not speak down to God like he is there for our whims. He is our king. He is our creator. He's our Father. Show respect and reverence for Him in your prayers. I want to leave you with some final thoughts about what you can be praying for on a regular basis. Pray for your family and for your loved ones. Pray that they would be in good health and they would find and know the love of Christ. Pray for your brothers and sisters here your brothers and sisters in Christ, we are fighting a spiritual battle every day. Sometimes we're fighting side by side and others we're fighting by ourselves one-on-one with the enemy. Pray that your brothers and sisters would have courage and strength to make it through the battles. Pray for your leaders, whether you like them or not. Government officials and politicians need our prayer. Municipal leaders need prayer. Your leaders at work need prayer. The leadership even here at Severn Christian Church needs your prayers. Pray for your enemies. It isn't easy to pray for someone you don't like. But Jesus tells us to pray for those who persecute you. Prayer is a powerful thing. Praying for someone you don't like can have a huge impact on you as you show love for others. And it could potentially even change their heart and their behavior. And then finally, pray for yourself. Pray because you are important too and you need God to intervene in your life. Pray that he would help you find your purpose and your calling. Pray that he would help you deal with that addiction. Pray that he would comfort you and bring you closure about the loss in your life. Pray that he would give you the words to speak truth to your children. Pray that you can learn to be a better parent or spouse. Pray that you will learn to submit to him and do his will no matter what the cost might be to you on this earth. We're getting ready to enter a time of worship and invitation where we get to thank God for all the things he's blessed us with. So if you feel like you are convicted to give back to God a portion of what he's blessed you with, this is the time to do that in our time of offering. I'm going to pray, and I want you to focus in on your relationship with Christ now. Father, we come to you, we come into your throne room this morning and bring you praise. We desire to draw close to you and submit to your will. We love you, Father. We thank you for your provision in our lives. We thank you for sheltering us from the storms of life. Father, please bring healing and protection to everyone who has been affected by the hurricane in Texas. We know that you are directly involved in their lives. By the massive supporters and and volunteers who have gone to help in that situation, Father, we ask now that you would protect us from our enemy and his evil efforts. Our desire is to do your will, Father, and serve you with our lives. Please show us what your will will for us is so we can be obedient to you. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son and his loving sacrifice for us. We love you, Father, and we praise you now. In your son's name we pray, amen.